Chapter forty seven of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Marden. Chapter forty seven Habit The Servant The Master. Habit, if wisely and skilfully formed, becomes truly a second nature. Bacon. Habit, with its iron sinews, clasps and leads us day by day. Lamartine. The chain of habit coils itself around the heart like a serpent, to gnaw and stifle it. Has lit. You cannot, in any given case, by any sudden and single effort, will to be true, if the habit of your life has been insincerity. F. W. Robertson. It is a beautiful provision in the mental and moral arrangement of our nature that that which is performed as a duty may by frequent repetition become a habit, and the habit of stern virtue so repulsive to others may hang around our neck like a wreath of flowers. Paxton Hood When shall I begin to train my child? asked a young mother of a learned physician. "'How old is the child?' inquired the doctor. Two years, sir.' "'Then you have lost just two years,' replied he, gravely. "'You must begin with his grandmother,' said Oliver Wendell Holmes, when asked a similar question. "'At the mouth of the Mississippi,' says Beecher, how impossible would it be to stay its waters and to separate from each other the drops from the various streams that have poured in on either side of the Red River, the Arkansas, the Ohio, and the Missouri, or to sift grain by grain the particles of sand that have been washed from the Allegheny or the Rocky Mountains? Yet how much more impossible would it be when character is the river? and habits are the side streams. We sow an act, we reap a habit. We sow a habit, we reap a character. While correct habits depend largely on self-discipline, and often on self-denial, bad habits, like weeds, spring up unaided and untrained to choke the plants of virtue, and as with Canada thistles, allowed to go to seed in a fair meadow, we may have one day's seeding, ten years weeding. We seldom see much change in people after they get to be twenty-five or thirty years of age, except in going further in the way they have started. But it is a great comfort to think that, when one is young, it is almost as easy to acquire a good habit as a bad one and that it is possible to be hardened in goodness as well as in evil. Take good care of the first twenty years of your life, and you may hope that the last twenty will take good care of you. A writer on the history of Staffordshire tells of an idiot who, living near a town clock, and always amusing himself by counting the hour of the day whenever the clock struck, continued to strike and count the hour correctly without its aid, when at one time it happened to be injured by an accident. Dr. Johnson had acquired the habit of touching every post he passed in the street, and if he missed one, he was uneasy, irritable, and nervous till he went back and touched the neglected post. Every thought is but a habit. Heredity is a man's habit transmitted to his offspring. A special study of hereditary drunkenness has been made by Professor Pellman of Bonn University, Germany. He thus traced the careers of children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren in all parts of the present German Empire, until he was able to present tabulated biographies of the hundreds descended from some original drunkard. Notable among the persons described by Professor Pellman is Frau Ada Jerk, 
who was born in 1740, and was a drunkard, a thief, and a tramp for the last forty years of her life, which ended in 1800. Her descendants numbered 834, of whom 709 were traced in local records from youth to death. 106 of the 709 were born out of wedlock. There were 144 beggars, and 62 more who lived from charity. Of the women, 181 led disreputable lives. There were in the family 76 convicts, seven of whom were sentenced to murder. In a period of some 75 years, this one family rolled up a bill of costs in almshouses, prisons, and correctional institutions, amounting to at least five million marks, or about one million two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Isaac Watts had a habit of rhyming. His father grew weary of it, and set out to punish him, which made the boy cry out, Pray, father, on me mercy take, and I will no more verses make. A minister had a bad habit of exaggeration, which seriously impaled his usefulness. His brethren came to expostulate, with extreme humiliation over this fault as they set it forth, he said, Brethren, I have long mourned over this fault, and I have shed barrels of tears because of it. They gave him up as incorrigible. Men carelessly or playfully get into habits of speech or act, which become so natural that they speak or act as they do not intend. To their discomfiture. Professor Phelps told of some Andover students who, for sport, interchanged the initial consonants of adjacent words. But, said he, retribution overtook them. On a certain morning, when one of them was leading the devotions, he prayed the Lord to have mercy on us, feek and weeble sinners. The habit had come to possess him. Many speakers have undesirable habits of utterance or gesture. Some are continually applying the hand to some part of the face, the chin, the whiskers. Some give the nose a peck with thumb and forefinger. Others have the habit characterized as washing the hands with invisible soap in a bowl of invisible water. We are continually denying that we have habits, which we have been practicing all our lives, says Beecher. Here is a man who has lived forty or fifty years, and a chance shot sentence or word lances him, and reveals to him a trait which he has always possessed, but which, until now, he had not the remotest idea that he possessed. For forty or fifty years he has been fooling himself about a matter as plain as the nose on his face. Had the angels been consulted whether to create man, with this principle introduced, that, if a man did a thing once, it would be easier the second time, and at length would be done without effort, they would have said, Create! Remember that habit is an arrangement, a principle of human nature, which we must use to increase the efficiency and ease of our work in life. Make sobriety a habit, and intemperance will be hateful. Make prudence a habit, and reckless profligacy will be as contrary to the course of nature in the child or in the adult as the most atrocious crimes are to any of us. Out of hundreds of replies from successful men as to the probable cause of failure, Bad habits was in almost every one. How easy it is to be nobody. It is the simplest thing in the world to drift down the stream, into bad company, into the saloon, just a little beer, just a little gambling, just a little bad company, just a little killing of time, and the work is done. 
New Orleans is from five to fifteen feet below high water in the Mississippi River. The only protection to the city from the river is the levee. In May 1883, a small break was observed in the levee, and the water was running through. A few bags of sand or loads of dirt would have stopped the water at first, but it was neglected for a few hours, and the current became so strong that all efforts to stop it were fruitless. A reward of $500,000 was offered to any man who would stop it, but it was too late. It could not be done. Beware of small sins and white lies. A man of experience says, There are four good habits, punctuality, accuracy, steadiness, and dispatch. Without the first, time is wasted. Without the second, mistakes, the most hurtful to our own credit and interest, and those of others, may be committed. Without the third, nothing can be well done, and without the fourth, opportunities of great advantage are lost, which it is impossible to recall. Abraham Lincoln gained his clear precision of statement of propositions by practice, and Wendell Phillips his wonderful English diction by always thinking and conversing in excellent style. Family customs exercise a vast influence over the world. Children go forth from the parent nest, spreading the habits they have imbibed over every phase of society. These can easily be traced to their sources. To be sure, this is only a trifle in itself, but then, the manner in which I do every trifling thing is of very great consequence, because it is just in these little things that I am forming my business habits. I must see to it that I do not fail here, even if this is only a small task. A physical habit is like a tree grown crooked. You cannot go to the orchard and take hold of a tree grown thus and straighten it and say, Now, keep straight, and have it obey you. What can you do? You can drive down a stake and to bind the tree to it, bending it back a little and scarifying the bark on one side. And if, after that, you bend it back a little more every month, keeping it taut through the season, and from season to season, at length you will succeed in making it permanently straight. You can straighten it, but you cannot do it immediately. You must take one or two years for it. Sir George Staunton visited a man in India who had committed murder, and in order not only to save his life, but what was of much greater consequence to him, his caste, he had submitted to a terrible penalty, to sleep for seven years on a bed, the entire top of which was studded with iron points as sharp as they could be without penetrating the flesh. Sir George saw him during the fifth year of his sentence. His skin then was like the hide of a rhinoceros, and he could sleep comfortably on his bed of thorns, and he said that at the end of the seven years he thought he should use the same bed from choice. What a vivid parable of a sinful life! Sin, at first a bed of thorns, after a time becomes comfortable through the deadening of moral sensibility. When the suspension bridge over Niagara River was to be erected, the question was how to get the cable over. With a favoring wind, a kite was elevated, which alighted on the opposite shores. To its insignificant string a cord was attached, which was drawn over, then a rope, then a larger one, then a cable. Finally, the great bridge was completed, connecting the United States with Canada. First across the gulf we cast, kite-borne threads till lines are passed, and habit builds the bridge at last. Launch your bark on the Niagara River, said John B. Goff. It is bright 
smooth and beautiful. Down the stream you glide on your pleasure excursion. Suddenly someone cries out from the bank, Young men, ahoy, what is it? The rapids are below you. Ha ha, we have heard of the rapids, but we are not such fools as to get there. If we go too fast, then we shall up with the helm and steer to the shore. Then on, boys, don't be alarmed. There is no danger. Young men, ahoy there, what is it? The rapids are below you. Ha ha, we will laugh and quaff. What care we for the future? No man ever saw it. Sufficient for the day is the evil thereof. We will enjoy life while we may. We'll catch pleasure as it flies. There's time enough to steer out of danger. Young man, ahoy! What is it? Beware, beware! The rapids are below you. Now you see the water foaming all around. See how fast you pass that point. Up with the helm. Now turn. Pull hard. Quick, quick! Pull for your lives. Pull till the blood starts from the nostrils, and the veins stand like whip cords upon the brow. Set the mast in the socket. Hoist the sail. Ah! Ah, it is too late! Shrieking, cursing, howling, blaspheming, over you go. Thousands go over the rapids every year, through the power of habit, crying all the while, When I find out that it is injuring me, I will give it up. The community is often surprised and shocked at some crime. The man was seen on the street yesterday, or in his store, but he showed no indication that he would commit such crime today. Yet the crime committed today is but a regular and natural sequence of what the man did yesterday and the day before. It was but a result of the fearful momentum of all his past habits. A painter once wanted a picture of innocence, and drew from life the likeness of a child at prayer. The little suppliant was kneeling by his mother. The palms of his hands were reverently pressed together, and his mild blue eyes were upturned with the expression of devotion and peace. The portrait was much prized by the painter, who hung it up on his wall and called it Innocence. Years passed away, and the artist became an old man. Still the picture hung there. He had often thought of painting a counterpart, the picture of guilt, but had not found the opportunity. At last he effected his purpose by paying a visit to a neighboring jail. On the damp floor of his cell lay a wretched culprit heavily ironed. Wasted was his body, and hollow his eyes. Vice was visible in his face. The painter succeeded admirably, and the portraits were hung side by side for innocence and guilt. The two originals of the pictures were discovered to be one and the same person, first in the innocence of childhood, second in the degradation of guilt and sin and evil habits. Willpower can be so educated that it will focus the thought upon the bright side of things, upon objects which lift and elevate. Habits of contentment and goodness may be formed the same as any others, walking upon the quarter-deck of a vessel, though at first intolerably confining, becomes by custom so agreeable to a sailor, that on shore he often hems himself within the same bounds. Lord Kames tells of a man who, having relinquished the sea for a country life, reared an artificial mount, with a level summit, resembling a quarter-deck not only in shape, but in size where he generally walked. When Franklin was superintending the erection of some forts on the frontier, as a defense against the Indians, he slept at night in a blanket on a hard floor, and, on his first return to civilized life, he could hardly sleep in a bed. Captain Ross and his crew, having been accustomed, during their polar wanderings, to lie on the frozen snow or a bare rock, afterwards found the accommodations of a whaler too luxurious for them, and the captain exchanged his hammock for a chair. 
two sailors who had been drinking took a boat off to their ship. They rowed but made no progress, and presently each began to accuse the other of not working hard enough. Lustily they plied the oars, but after another hour's work still found themselves no farther advanced. By this time they had become tolerably sober, and one of them, looking over the side, said to the other, "'Why, Tom, we haven't pulled the anchor up yet.' And thus it is with those who are anchored to something of which they are not conscious, perhaps, but which impedes their efforts, even though they do their very best. A youth, thoughtless, when all the happiness of his home forever depends on the chances or the passions of an hour, exclaims Ruskin. A youth thoughtless, when his every act is a foundation stone of future conduct, and every imagination a fountain of life or death. Be thoughtless in any after years, rather than now, though indeed there is only one place where a man may be nobly thoughtless, his deathbed. No thinking should ever be left to be done there. Sir James Paget tells us that a practised musician can play on the piano at the rate of twenty-four notes a second. For each note, a nerve current must be transmitted from the brain to the fingers, and from the fingers to the brain. Each note requires three movements of a finger, the bending down and raising up, and at least one lateral, making no less than seventy-two motions in a second, each requiring a distinct effort of the will, and directed unerringly with a certain speed and a certain force to a certain place. Some can do this easily, and be at the same time busily employed in intelligent conversation. Thus, by obeying the law of habit until repetition has formed a second nature, we are able to pass the technique of life almost wholly over to the nerve centers, leaving our minds free to act or enjoy. All through our lives the brain is constantly educating different parts of the body to form habits which will work automatically from reflex action, and thus is delegated to the nervous system a large part of life's duties. This is nature's wonderful economy to release the brain from the drudgery of individual acts, and leave it free to command all its forces for higher service. Man's life work is a masterpiece or a botch, according as each little habit has been perfectly or carelessly formed. It is said that if you invite one of the devil's children to your home, the whole family will follow. So one bad habit seems to have a relationship with all the others. For instance, the one habit of negligence, slovenliness, makes it easier to form others equally bad, until the entire character is honeycombed by the invasion of a family of bad habits. A man is often shocked when he suddenly discovers that he is considered a liar. He never dreamed of forming such a habit, but the little misrepresentations, to gain some temporary end, had, before he was aware of it, made a beaten track in the nerve and brain tissue, until lying has become almost a physical necessity. He thinks he can easily overcome this habit, but he will not. He is bound to it with cords of steel, and only by painful, watchful, and careful repetition of the exact truth, with a special effort of the willpower at each act, can he form a counter-trunk line in the nerve and brain tissue. Society is often shocked by the criminal act of a man who has always been considered upright and true. But if they could examine the habit map in his nervous mechanism and brain, they would find the beginnings of a path leading directly to his deed, in the tiny repetitions of what he regarded as trivial acts. All expert and technical education is built upon the theory that these trunk lines of habit become more and more sensitive to their accustomed stimuli, and respond more and more readily. 
we are apt to overlook the physical basis of habit. Every repetition of an act makes us more likely to perform that act, and discovers in our wonderful mechanism a tendency to perpetual repetition, whose facility increases in exact proportion to the repetition. Finally, the original act becomes voluntary from a natural reaction. It is cruel to teach the vicious that they can, by mere force of willpower, turn about face, and go in the other direction, without explaining to them the scientific process of character building through habit formation. What we do today is practically what we did yesterday, and in spite of resolutions, unless carried out in this scientific way, we shall repeat tomorrow what we have done today. How unfortunate that the science of habit forming is not known by mothers and taught in our schools, colleges, and universities. It is a science compared with which other departments of education sink into insignificance. The converted man is not always told that the great battle is yet before him, that he must persistently, painfully, prayerfully, and with all the willpower he possesses, break up the old habits and lay counter lines which will lead to the temple of virtue. He is not told that, in spite of all his efforts, in some unguarded moment, some old switch may be left open, some old desire may flash along the line, and that, possibly, before he is aware of it, he may find himself yielding to the old temptation which he had supposed to be conquered forever. An old soldier was walking home with a beefsteak in one hand and a basket of eggs in the other, when someone yelled, Halt! Attention! Instantly, the veteran came to a stand, and, as his arms took the position of attention, eggs and meat went tumbling into the street, the accustomed nerves responding involuntarily to the old stimulus. Paul evidently understood the force of habit. I find, then, he declares, the law that to me who would do good, evil is present. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see a different law in my members, warring against the law in my mind, and bringing me into captivity under the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He referred to the ancient custom of binding a murderer face to face with the dead body of his victim, until suffocated by its stench and disillusion. I would give a world if I had it, said an unfortunate wretch, to be a true man. Yet in twenty-four hours I may be overcome and disgraced with a shilling's worth of sin. How shall I a habit break, as ye did that habit make. As you gathered, you must lose. As you yielded, now refuse. Thread by thread the strands we twist, till they bind us, neck and wrist. Thread by thread the patient hand, must untwine, ere free we stand. As we builded, stone by stone, we must toil unhelped, alone till the wall is overthrown. End of chapter 47 Habit The Servant The Master Chapter 48 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Marden Chapter 48 The Cigarette We are so accustomed to the sight and smell of tobacco we entirely overlook the fact that the tobacco of commerce, in all its forms, is the product of a poisonous weed. It is first a narcotic, and then an irritant poison. It has its place in all toxicological classifications, together with its proper antidotes. Tobacco has not achieved its 
almost universal popularity, without strong opposition. In England, King James launched his famous counterblast against its use. In Turkey, where men and women are alike slaves to its fascination, tobacco was originally forbidden under severe penalties. The loss of the ears, the slitting of the nostrils, and even death itself being penalties imposed for the infraction of the law forbidding the use of tobacco in any form. Since then, pipes, cigars, snuff, and chewing tobacco have become popularized, and tobacco, in some form or another, is used by almost every nation. The last development in the form of tobacco used was the cigarette rolled between the fingers, and the worst form of the cigarette is the manufactured article sold in cheap packages, and freely used by boys who in many cases have not reached their teens. The manufactured American cigarette seems to be especially deadly in its effect. It is said to contain five and one-half percent of nicotine, or more than twice as much as the Cuban-made cigarette contains, and more than six times as much as is contained in the Turkish cigarette. I am not going to quarrel with the use of tobacco in general by mature men. He who has come to man's estate is free to decide for himself whether he shall force a poison on his revolting stomach, for the nausea that follows the first use of tobacco is the stomach's attempt to eject the poison which has been absorbed from pipe, cigar, or cigarette. The grown man, too, is able to determine whether he wants to pay the tax which the use of tobacco levies upon his time, his health, his income, and his prosperity. The most that can be said of the use of tobacco is that if habitual users of the narcotic weed are successful in life, they must be successful in spite of the use of tobacco, and not because of it for it is opposed to both reason and common sense that the habitual use of poison in any form should promote the development and exercise of the faculties whose energetic use is essential to success. What I desire to do is to warn the boy, the growing youth, of the baneful influence of the cigarette on minds yet unformed, on bodies yet in process of development. The danger of the cigarette to the growing boy lies first in the fact that it poisons the body. That it does not kill at the outset is due to the fact that the dose is small and so slowly increased that the body gradually accommodates itself to this poison as it does to strychnine, arsenic, opium, and other poisons but all the time there is a slow but steady process of physical degeneration. The digestion is affected, the heart is overtaxed, liver and bowels are deranged in their functions, and as the poison spreads throughout the system there is a gradual physical deterioration, which is marked alike in the countenance and in the carriage of the body. Any person who cares to do so may prove for himself the poisonous nature of nicotine, which is derived from tobacco, and taken into the system by those who chew or smoke. Dr. J. J. Kellogg says, A few months ago I had all the nicotine removed from a cigarette, making a solution of it. I injected half the quantity into a frog, with the effect that the frog died almost instantly. The rest was administered to another frog with like effect. Both frogs were full grown and of average size. The conclusion is evident that a single cigarette contains poison enough to kill two frogs. A boy who smokes twenty cigarettes a day has inhaled enough poison to kill forty frogs. Why does the poison not kill the boy? It does tend to kill him. If not immediately, he is likely to die sooner or later of weak heart, bright's disease, or some other malady 
which scientific physicians everywhere now recognize as a natural result of chronic nicotine poisoning. A chemist not long since took the tobacco used in an average cigarette and soaked it in several teaspoonfuls of water and then injected a portion of it under the skin of a cat. The cat almost immediately went into convulsions and died in fifteen minutes. Dogs have been killed with a single drop of nicotine. A single drop of nicotine, taken from a seasoned pipe, and applied to the tongue of a venomous snake, has caused almost instant death. A western farmer tried to rear a brood of motherless chickens in his greenhouse, but the chickens did not survive. They refused to eat. Their skins became dry and harsh. Their feathers were ruffled. They were feverish and drank constantly. Soon they began to die. As the temperature and general condition of the greenhouse seemed to be especially favorable to the rearing of chickens, the florist was puzzled to determine the cause of their sickness and death. After a careful study of the symptoms, he found that the source of the trouble arose from the fumes of the tobacco stems burned in the greenhouse to destroy green flies and destructive plant parasites. Though the chickens had always been removed from the greenhouse during the tobacco fumigation, and were not returned while any trace of smoke was apparent to the human senses, it was evident that the soil, air, and leaves of the plants retained enough of the poison to keep the chickens in a condition of semi-intoxication. The conditions were promptly changed, and the chickens removed to other quarters, recovered rapidly, and in a short time were healthy and lively, though they were stunted in growth because of this temporary exposure to the effects of nicotine. The symptoms in the chickens were almost identical with the symptoms of nicotine poisoning in young boys and the effects were relatively the same. The most moderate use of the cigarette is injurious to the body and mind of the youth. Excessive indulgence leads inevitably to insanity and death. A young man died in a Minnesota state institution not long ago, who, five years before, had been one of the most promising young physicians of the West. Still under thirty years, at the time of his commitment to the institution, says the newspaper account of his story, he has already made three discoveries in nervous diseases that had made him looked up to in his profession. But he smoked cigarettes, smoked incessantly. For a long time, the effects of the habit were not apparent on him. In fact, it was not until the patient died on the operating table under his hands and the young doctor went to pieces that it became known that he was a victim of the paper pipes. But then he had gone too far. He was a wreck in mind as well as in body, and he ended his days in a maniac's cell. Another unfortunate victim of the cigarette was, not long ago, taken to the Brooklyn Hospital. He was a fireman on the railroad, and was only twenty-one years old. He said he began smoking cigarettes when a mere boy. Before being taken to the hospital, he smoked all night for weeks without sleep. When in the hospital, he recognized none, but called loudly to everyone he saw to kill him. He would batter his head against the wall in the attempt to commit suicide. At length he was taken to the King's County Hospital in a straight jacket, where death soon relieved him of his sufferings. Similar results are following the excessive use of cigarettes every day and in all sections of the country. Died of heart failure is the daily verdict on scores of those who drop down at the desk or in the street. Cannot this sudden taking off of apparently hale and sturdy men be related, oftentimes, to the heart weakness caused by the excessive use of tobacco, and particularly of cigarettes? 
excessive cigarette smoking increases the heart's action very materially, in some instances twenty-five or thirty beats a minute. Think of the enormous amount of extra work forced upon this delicate organ every twenty-four hours. The pulsations are not only greatly increased, but also very materially weakened, so that the blood is not forced to every part of the system, and hence the tissues are not nourished as they would be by means of fewer but stronger, more vigorous pulsations. The indulgence in cigarettes stunts the growth and retards physical development. An investigation of all the students who entered Yale University during nine years shows that the cigarette smokers were the inferiors, both in weight and lung capacity, of the non-smokers, although they averaged fifteen months older. It has been said that the universal habit of smoking has made Germany a spectacled nation. Tobacco greatly irritates the eyes and injuriously affects the optic nerves. The eyes of boys who use cigarettes to excess grow dull and weak, and every feature shows the mark of the insidious poison. The face is pallid and haggard, the cheeks hollow the skin drawn, there is a loss of frankness of expression, the eyes are shifty, the movements nervous and uncertain, and all this is but preliminary to the ultimate degradation and loss of self-respect which follow the victim of the cigarette habit through years of misery and failure. Side by side with physical deterioration, there goes on a process of moral degeneration, which robs the cigarette-smoking boy of refinement, of manners. The moral depravity which follows cigarette habit is appalling. Lying, cheating, swearing, impurity, loss of courage and manhood, complete dropping of life standards, result from such indulgence. Magistrate Crane of New York City says, Ninety-nine out of a hundred boys between the ages of ten and seventeen years who come before me charged with crime have their fingers disfigured by yellow cigarette stains. I am not a crank on this subject. I do not care to pose as a reformer. But it is my opinion that cigarettes will do more than liquor to ruin boys. When you have arranged before you boys hopelessly deaf through the excessive use of cigarettes, boys who have stolen their sister's earnings, boys who absolutely refuse to work, who do nothing but gamble and steal, you cannot help seeing that there is some direct cause, and a great deal of this boyhood crime is, in my mind, easy to trace to the deadly cigarette. There is something in the poison of the cigarette seems to get into the system of the boy, and to destroy all moral fibre. He gives the following probable course of a boy who begins to smoke cigarettes. First, cigarettes. Second, beer and liquors. Third, craps. Petty gambling. Fourth, horse racing. Gambling on a bigger scale. Fifth, Larceny. Sixth, State Prison. Another New York City magistrate says, Yesterday I had before me thirty-five boy prisoners. Thirty-three of them were confirmed cigarette smokers. Today, from a reliable source, I have made the gruesome discovery that two of the largest cigarette manufacturers soak their product in a weak solution of opium. The fact that out of thirty-five prisoners, thirty-three smoked cigarettes, might seem to indicate some direct connection between cigarettes and crime. And when it is announced on authority that most cigarettes are doped with opium, this connection is not hard to understand. Opium is like whiskey. It creates an increasing appetite that grows with what it feeds upon. 
a growing boy who lets tobacco and opium get a hold upon his senses, is never long in coming under the domination of whiskey, too. Tobacco is the boy's easiest and most direct road to whiskey. When opium is added, the young boy's chance of resisting the combined forces and escaping physical, mental, and moral harm is slim indeed. I think the above statement regarding the use of opium by manufacturers is exaggerated. Yet we know that young men of great natural ability, everywhere, some of them in high positions, are constantly losing their grip, deteriorating, dropping back, losing their ambition, their push, their stamina, and their energy, because of the cigarette's deadly hold upon them. Did you ever watch the gradual deterioration of the cigarette smoker, the gradual withdrawal of manliness and character? the fading out of purpose, the decline of ambition, the substitution of the beastly for the manly, the decline of the divine, and the ascendancy of the brute. A very interesting study, this, to watch the gradual withdrawal from the face of all that was manly and clean, and all that makes for success. We can see where purity left him, and was gradually replaced by vulgarity, and where he began to be cursed by commonness. We can see the point at which he could begin to do a bad job, or a poor day's work, without feeling troubled about it. We can tell when he began to lose his great pride in his personal appearance, when he began to leave his room in the morning and to go to his work without being perfectly groomed. Only a little while before, he would have been greatly mortified to have been by his employers and associates with slovenly dress. But now, baggy trousers, unblackened shoes, soiled linen, frayed necktie, do not trouble him. He is not quite as conscientious about his work as he used to be. He can leave a half-finished job, and cut his hours, and rob his employer a little here and there, without being troubled seriously. He can write a slipshod letter. He isn't particular about his spelling, punctuation, or handwriting, as formerly. He doesn't mind a little deceit. Vulgarity no longer shocks him. He does not blush at the unclean test. Womanhood is not as sacred to him as in his innocent days. He does not reverence women as formerly, and he finds himself laughing at the coarse jest and the common remarks about them among his associates, and when he would have resented and turned away in disgust. Dr. Lewis Bremer, late physician at St. Vincent's Institute for the Insane, says, Basing my opinion upon my experience gained in private sanitariums and hospitals i will broadly state that the boy who smokes cigarettes at seven will drink whiskey at fourteen take morphine at twenty-five and wind up at thirty with cocaine and the rest of the narcotics the saddest effects of cigarette smoking are mental the physical signs of deterioration have their mental correspondencies. So William Hamilton said, There is nothing great in matter but man. There is nothing great in man but mind. The cigarette smoker takes man's distinguishing faculty and uncrowns it. He puts an enemy in his mouth to steal away his brains. Anything which impairs one's success capital which cuts down his achievement and makes him a possible failure when he might have been a grand success is a crime against him. Anything which benumbs the senses, deadens the sensibilities, dulls the mental faculties, and takes the edge off one's ability is a deadly enemy, and there is nothing else which affects all this so quickly as the cigarette. 
it is said that within the past fifty years not a student at Harvard University who used tobacco has been graduated at the head of his class, although, on the average, five out of six use tobacco. The symptoms of a cigarette victim resembles those of an opium eater, a gradual deadening, benumbing influence creeps all through the mental and moral faculties the standards all drop to a lower level the whole average of life is cut down the victim loses that power of mental grasp the grip of mind which he once had in place of his former energy and vim and push he is more and more inclined to take things easy and to slide along the line of the least resistance he becomes less and less progressive. He dreams more and acts less. Hard work becomes more and more irksome and repulsive until work seems drudgery to him. Professor William McKeever of the Kansas Agricultural College, in the course of his findings after an exhaustive study of The Cigarette Smoking Boy, presents facts which are as appalling as they are undeniable. For the past eight years I have been tracing out the cigarette boy's biography, and I have found that in practically all cases the lad began his smoking habit clandestinely, and with little thought of its seriousness, while the fond parents perhaps believed that their boy was too good to engage in such practice. I have tabulated reports of the condition of nearly 2,500 cigarette-smoking schoolboys, and in describing them physically, my informants have repeatedly resorted to the use of such epithets as sallow, sore-eyed, puny, squeaky-voiced, sickly, short-winded, and extremely nervous. In my tabulated reports it is shown that out of a group of twenty-five cases of young college students, smokers whose average age of beginning was thirteen, according to their own admissions, they had suffered as follows. Sore throat, four. Weak eyes, ten. Pain in chest, eight. Short wind, twenty-one. Stomach trouble, ten. Pain in heart, nine. Ten of them appeared to be very sickly. The younger the boy, the worse the smoking hurts him in every way, for these lads almost invariably inhale the fumes, and that is the most injurious part of the practice. Professor McKeever made hundreds of sphygmograph recordings of boys addicted to the smoking habit. Discussing what the records showed, he says, the injurious effects of smoking upon the boy's mental activities are very marked. Of the many hundreds of tabulated cases in my possession, several of the very youthful ones have been reduced almost to the condition of imbeciles. Out of 2,336 who were attending public school, only six were reported bright students. A very few, perhaps ten, were average, and all the remainder were poor or worthless as students. The average grades of fifty smokers and fifty non-smokers were computed from the records of one term's work done in the Kansas Agricultural College, and the results favored the latter group with a difference of 17.5 per cent. The two groups represented the same class rank, that is, the same number of seniors, juniors, sophomores, and freshmen. A thorough investigation of the effects of cigarette smoking on boys has been carried on in one of the San Francisco schools for many months. This investigation was ordered because a great many of the boys were inferior to the girls, both mentally and morally. It was found that nearly three-fourths of the boys who smoked cigarettes had nervous disorders, while only one of those who did not smoke had any nervous symptoms. A great many of the cigarette smokers had defective hearing, 
while only one of those who did not smoke were so afflicted. A large percentage of the boys who smoked were defective in memory, while only one boy who did not smoke was so affected. A large portion of the boys who smoked were reported as low in deportment and morals, while only a very small percentage of those who did not smoke were similarly affected. It was found that the minds of many of the cigarette smokers could not comprehend or grasp ideas as quickly or firmly as those who did not smoke. Nearly all of the cigarette smokers were found to be untidy and unclean in their personal appearance, and a great many of them were truants. But among those who did not smoke, not a single boy had been corrected for truancy. Most of the smokers ranked very low in their studies as compared with those who did not smoke. Seventy-nine per cent of them failed of promotion, while the percentage of failure among those who did not smoke was exceedingly small. Of twenty boy smokers who were under careful observation for several months, nineteen stood below the average of the class, while only two of those who did not smoke stood below. Seventeen out of the twenty were very poor workers and seemed absolutely incapable of close or continuous application to any of their studies. Professor Wilkinson, principal of a leading high school, says, I will not try to educate a boy with a cigarette habit. It is wasted time. The mental faculties of the boy who smokes cigarettes are blunted. Another high school principal says, Boys who smoke cigarettes are always backward in their studies. They are filthy in their personal habits, and coarse in their manners. They are hard to manage and dull in appearance. It is apparent, therefore, that the cigarette habit disqualifies the student mentally, that it retards him in his studies, dwarfs his intellect, and leaves him far behind those of inferior mental equipment who do not indulge in the injurious use of tobacco in any form. The mental, moral, and physical deterioration from the use of cigarettes has been noted by corporations and employers of labor generally. Until today, the cigarette devotee finds himself barred from many positions that are open to those of inferior capabilities who are not enslaved by the deadly habit. Cigarette smoking is no longer simply a moral question. The great business world has taken it up as a deadly enemy of advancement, of achievement. Leading business firms all over the country have put the cigarette on the prohibited list. In Detroit alone, 69 merchants have agreed not to employ the cigarette user. In Chicago, Montgomery Ward and Company Hibbard, Spencer and Bartlett, and some of the other large concerns have prohibited cigarette smoking among all employees under 18 years of age. Marshall Field and Company and the Morgan and Wright Tire Company have this rule. No cigarettes can be smoked by our employees. One of the questions on the application blanks at Wanamaker's reads, do you use tobacco or cigarettes? The superintendent of the Linden Street Railway of St. Louis says, Under no circumstance will I hire a man who smokes cigarettes. He is as dangerous on the front of a motor as a man who drinks. In fact, he is more dangerous. His nerves are apt to give way at any moment. If I find a car running badly, I immediately begin to investigate to find if the man smokes cigarettes. Nine times out of ten he does, and then he goes for good. The late E. H. Harriman, head of the Union Pacific Railroad System, used to say that they might as well go to a lunatic asylum for their employees as to hire cigarette smokers. The Union Pacific Railroad prohibits cigarette smoking among its employees. The New York 
New Haven and Hartford, the Chicago, Rock Island, and Pacific, the Lehigh Valley, the Burlington, and many others of the leading railroad companies of this country have issued orders positively forbidding the use of cigarettes by employees while on duty. Some time ago, twenty-five laborers working on a bridge were discharged by the roadmasters of the West Superior, Wisconsin Railroad, because of cigarette smoking. The Pittsburgh and Western Railroad, which is part of the Baltimore and Ohio system, gave orders forbidding the use of cigarettes by its employees on passenger trains, and also notified passengers that they must not smoke cigarettes in their coaches. In the call issued for the competitive examination for messenger service in the Chicago Post Office, some time since, 700 applicants were informed that only the best equipped boys were wanted for this service, and that under no circumstances would boys who smoked cigarettes be employed. Other post offices have taken a similar stand. If someone should present you with a most delicately adjusted chronometer, one which would not vary a second in a year, do you think it would pay you to trifle with it, to open the case in the dust, to leave it out in the rain overnight, or to put in a drop of glue or a chemical which would ruin the delicacy of its adjustment? so that it would no longer keep good time? Would you think it wise to take such chances? But the Creator has given you a matchless machine, so delicately and wondrously made, that it takes a quarter of a century to bring it to perfection, to complete growth, and yet you presume to trifle with it, to do all sorts of things which are infinitely worse than leaving your watch open out of doors overnight, or even in water. The great object of the watch is to keep time. The supreme purpose of this marvellous piece of human machinery is power. The watch means nothing except time. If the human machinery does not produce power, it is of no use. The merest trifle will prevent the watch from keeping time. But you think that you can put anything into your human machinery, that you can do all sorts of irrational things with it, and yet you expect it to produce power, to keep perfect time. It is important that the human machine shall be kept as responsive to the slightest impression or influence as possible, and the brain should be kept clear, so that the thought may be sharp, biting, gripping, so that the whole mentality will act with efficiency. And yet you do not hesitate to saturate the delicate brain cells with vile drinks, to poison them with nicotine, to harden them with smoke from the vilest of weeds. You expect the man to turn out as exquisite work, to do the most delicate things, to retain his exquisite sense of ability, notwithstanding the hardening the benumbing influence of cigarette poisoning. Let the boy or youth who is tempted to indulge in the first cigarette ask himself, Can I afford to take this enormous risk? Can I jeopardize my health, my strength, my future, my all, by indulging in a practice which has ruined tens of thousands of promising lives? Let the youth who is tempted say, No, I will wait until mind and body are developed, until I have reached man's estate, before I will begin to use tobacco. Experience proves that those who reach a robust manhood are rarely willing to sacrifice health and happiness to the cigarette habit. Many years ago an eminent physician and specialist in nervous diseases put himself on record as holding the firm belief that the evil effects of the use of tobacco were more lasting and far-reaching than the injurious consequences that follow the excessive use of alcohol. 
apart from affections of the throat and cancerous diseases of lips and tongue, which frequently affect smokers, there is a physical taint which is transmitted to offspring, which handicaps the unfortunate infant from its earliest breath. The only salvation of the race, said this physician, lay in the fact that women did not smoke. If they too acquired the tobacco habit, future generations would be stamped by the degeneracy and depravity which followed the use of tobacco as surely as they followed the use of alcohol. In view of these facts, the increase of cigarette smoking among women may well alarm those who have at heart the well-being of the rising generation. So rapidly has this habit spread that fashionable hotels and cafes are providing rooms for the especial use of those women who'd like to indulge in an after-dinner cigarette. A noted restaurant in New York recently added an annex to which ladies with their escorts might retire and smoke. We often see women smoking in New York hotels and restaurants. Not long ago, the writer was a guest at a dinner, and to his surprise several ladies at the table lighted their cigarettes with as much composure as if it were the most natural thing in the world. At a reception recently, I saw the granddaughter of one of America's greatest authors smoking cigarettes. What a spectacle to see a descendant so nearly removed from one of nature's grandest noblemen, a princely gentleman, smoking. And I said to myself, What would a grandfather think if he could see this? On a train running between London and Liverpool, a compartment especially reserved for women smokers has been provided. It is said that three American women were the cause of this innovation. The superintendent of one of our largest American railways says that he would not be surprised if the American roads were compelled to follow the lead of their English brethren. It is not unreasonable to suppose that this addiction to the use of tobacco is in many cases inherited. A friend told me of a very charming young woman who was passionately devoted to tobacco. At a time when it was not usual for women to smoke in public, her craving for a cigarette was so strong that she could not deny herself the indulgence. She said her father, a deacon in the church, had been an inveterate smoker, and her love of tobacco dated back to her earliest remembrance. Every woman should use the uttermost of her influence to discourage the use of the cigarette and enlist the girls as well as boys in her fight against the evil and injurious practice of cigarette smoking. End of chapter 48 The Cigarette Chapter 49 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Marden Chapter 49 The Power of Purity Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Sermon on the Mount My strength is as the strength of ten, because my heart is pure. Tennyson Virtue alone raises us above hopes, fears, and chances. Seneca even from the body's purity, the mind receives a secret sympathetic aid. Thompson Purity is the broad word with a deep meaning. It denotes far more than superficial cleanness. It goes below the surface of guarded speech and polite manners to the very heart of being. Out of the heart are the issues of life. Make the fountain clean, and the waters that flow from it will be pure and limpid. Make the heart clean, and the life will be clean. 
purity is defined as free from contact with that which weakens, impairs, or pollutes. How forceful, then, is the converse of the definition. Impurity weakens, impairs, and pollutes. It weakens both mind and body. It impairs the health. It pollutes not only the thoughts, but the conduct, which inevitably has its beginning and its end in thought. Innocence is the state of natural purity. It was the state of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. When they sinned, they knew that they were naked. They lost innocence, never to regain it. But purity may be attained. As an unclean garment may be washed, so the heart may be purified and made clean. Ghosts of past impurities still may dog us, but they are ghosts that may be laid with an imperative, Get thee behind me, Satan. They are like the lions that are frighted, Bunyan's pilgrim, chained securely. They may roar and threaten, but they are powerless if we deny their power. The man who is striving for purity wholeheartedly is like one who sits safely in a guarded house. Old memories of evil things, like spectres, may peer in at the windows and mow and gibber at him, but they cannot touch him unless he gives them power, unless he unlocks the door of his heart and bids them enter. As the lotus flower grows out of the mud, so may purity and beauty spring up from even the vilest past, if we but will it so. As purity is power, so impurity is impotence, weakness, degeneracy. Many a man goes on in an impure career, thinking himself secure, thinking his secret hidden. But impurity, like murder, will out. There was a noted pugilist who was unexpectedly defeated in a great ring battle. People said the fight was a fake, that it was a put-up job. But those who knew said, Impurity. He had lived an evil, debauched life for several years, and he went into the ring impaired in strength, weakened by his transgressions of the law of pure living. Purity is power, impurity is weakness. There is a saying of scripture which is absolutely scientific. Be sure your sin will find you out. Note this, it is not that your sin will be found out, but your sin will find you out. Sin recoils on the sinner, and of all sins that surely find us out, the sins against purity are the most certain to bring retribution. Young men do not think that listening to an off-color story, or anything that is vulgar, can injure them much, and, for fear of ridicule, they laugh when they hear anything of the kind, even when it is repulsive to them, and when they loathe it. It is a rare thing for a young man to express with emphasis his disapproval. To know life properly is to know the best in it, not the worst. No one ever yet was made stronger by his knowledge of impurity or experience in sin. It is said that the mind's phonograph will faithfully reproduce a bad story, even up to the point of death. Do not listen once. You can never get the stain entirely out of your life. Your character will absorb a poison. Impurity is especially fatal in its grasp upon the young because of the vividness of the youthful imagination and the facility with which insinuating suggestions enter the youthful thought. Our court records show that a very large percentage of criminals began their downfall through the fatal contagion of impurity communicated from various associations. Remember that you cannot tell what may come to you in the future, 
what honor or promotion, and you cannot afford to take chances upon having anything in your history which can come up to embarrass you or to keep you back. A thing which you now look upon as a bit of pleasure may come up in the future to hamper your progress. The thing you do today while trying to have a good time may come up to block your progress years afterwards. I know men who have been thrust into positions of honor and public trust who would give anything in the world if they could blot out some of the unclean experiences of their youth. Things in their early history which they had forgotten all about and which they never expected to hear from again are raked up when they become candidates for office or positions of trust. These forgotten bits of so-called pleasure loom up in after life as insurmountable bars across their pathway. I know a very rich young man who thought he was just having a good time in his youth, sowing his wild oats, who would give a large part of his vast wealth today if he could blot out a few years of his folly. It seems strange that men will work hard to build a reputation and then throw it all away by some weakness in their character. How many men there are in this country with great brain power, men who are kings in their specialties, men who have worked like slaves to achieve their aims, whose reputations have been practically ruined by the flaw of impurity. Character is a record of our thoughts and acts. That which we think about most, the ideals and motives uppermost in our mind, are constantly solidifying into character. What we are constantly thinking about, and aiming toward, and trying to obtain, becomes a permanent part of the life. The man whose thoughts are low and impure, very quickly gives this bent and tendency to his character. The character levels itself with the thought, whether high or low. No man can have a pure, clean character who does not habitually have pure, clean thoughts. The immoral man is invariably an impure thinker. Whatever we harbor in the mind outpictures itself in the body. In eastern countries the leper is compelled to cry, Unclean! Unclean! upon the approach of any one not so cursed. What a blessing to humanity if our modern moral lepers were compelled to cry, Unclean! Unclean! before they approach innocent victims with their deadly contagion. About the vilest thing on earth is a human being whose character is so tainted with impurity that he leaves the slimy trail of the serpent wherever he goes. There never was a more beautiful and pathetic prayer than that of the poor soil, broken-hearted psalmist in his hour of shame. Create in me a clean heart. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. There are thousands of men who would cut off their right hands today to be free from the stain, the poison, of impurity. There can be no lasting greatness without purity. Vice honeycombs the physical strength, as well as destroys the moral fiber. Now and again, some man of note topples with a crash to sudden ruin. Yet the cause of the moral collapse is not sudden. There has been a slow undermining of virtue, going on probably for years. Then, in an hour when honor, truth, or honesty is brought to a crucial test, the weakened character gives way, and there is an appalling commercial or social crash, which often finds an echo in the revolver shot of the suicide. Tennyson shows the effect of Launcelot's guilty love for Guinevere in the great knight's conscious loss of power. His wrongful passion indirectly brought about the death of fair Elaine. 
He himself at times shrank from puny men, wont to go down before the shadow of his spear. Like a scarlet blot, his sin stains all his greatness, and he muses on it remorsefully. For what am I? What profits me my name? Of greatest knight? I fought for it and have it. Pleasure to have it, none. To lose it, pain. Now grown a part of me, but what use in it? To make men worse by making my sin known? Or sin seem less, the sinner seeming great? Later, when the knights of the round table joined in the search for the Holy Grail, that lost sacred vessel, the cup, the cup itself from which our Lord drank at the last sad supper with his own. Launcelot was overtaken by his sin and failed ignominiously. Only Galahad the Pure was permitted to see the cup unsurrounded by a blinding glory a fearful splendor of watching eyes and guarding shapes. No one is quite the same in his own estimation when he has been once guilty of contact with impurity. His self-respect has suffered a loss. Something has gone out of his life. His own good opinion of himself has suffered deterioration, and he can never face his life task with quite the same confidence again. Somehow he feels that the world will know of his soul's debauch, and to judge him accordingly. There is nothing which will mar a life more quickly than the consciousness of a soul stain. The loss of self-respect, the loss of character, is irreparable. We are beginning to find that there is an intimate connection between absolute purity of one's thought and life, and his good health good thinking, and good work. A very close connection between the moral faculties and the physical health, that nothing so exhausts the vitality and vitiates the quality of work and ideals, so takes the edge off of one's ambition, dulls the brain and aspiration as impurity of thought and life. It seems to blight all the faculties, and to demoralize the whole man, so that his efficiency is very much lessened. He does not speak with the same authority. The air of the conqueror disappears from his manner. He does not think so clearly. He does not act with so great certainty, and his self-faith is lost, because confidence is based upon self-respect and he can no longer respect himself when he does things which he would not respect in another. The fact that his impure acts are done secretly makes no difference. No one can thoroughly respect himself when he does that which demoralizes him, which is unbecoming a gentleman, no matter whether other people know it or not. Impurity blights everything it touches. It is not enough to be thought pure and clean and sound. One must actually be pure and clean and sound morally, or his self-respect is undermined. Purity is power because it means integrity of thought, integrity of conduct. It means wholeness. The impure man cannot be a great power because he cannot thoroughly believe in himself when conscious that he is rotten in any part of his nature. Impurity works like leaven, which affects everything in a man. The very consciousness that the impurity is working within him robs him of power. Apart from the moral side of this question, let us show how these things affect one's success in life by sapping the energies, weakening the nature lowering one's standards, blurring one's ideals, discouraging one's ambition, and lessening one's vitality and power. In the last analysis of success, the mainspring of achievement must rest 
in the strength of one's vitality for, without a stock of health equal to great emergencies and persistent longevity, even the greatest ambition is comparatively powerless, and there is nothing that will sap the life forces so quickly as dissipation and impure living. Is there anything truer than that? To be carnally minded is death. If the thought is carnal, the body must respond, must express it in some physical discord. Nothing else will destroy the very foundations of vitality, quicker than impurity of thought and animal self-indulgence. The ideals must be kept bright, and the ambition clean-cut. Purity of thought means that the mental processes are not clouded, muddy, or clogged by brain ash from a dissipated life, from violation of the laws of health. Pure thought comes from pure blood, and pure blood from a clean, sane life. Purity signifies a great deal besides freedom from sensual taint. It means saneness, purity, and quality. It has been characteristic of great leaders, men whose greatness has stood the acid test of time, that they have been virtuous in conduct, pure in thought. I have such a rich story that I want to tell you, said an officer, who one evening came into the Union camp in a rollicking mood. There are no ladies present, are there? General Grant, lifting his eyes from the paper which he was reading, and looking the officer squarely in the eye, said slowly and deliberately, No, but there are gentlemen present. A great trait of Grant's character, said George W. Childs, was his purity. I never heard him express an impure thought, or make an indelicate allusion in any way or shape. There is nothing I ever heard him say that could not be repeated in the presence of women. If a man was brought up for an appointment, and it was shown that he was an immoral man, Grant would not appoint him, no matter how great the pressure brought to bear. On one occasion, when Grant formed one of a dinner party of Americans in a foreign city, conversation drifted into references to questionable affairs, when he suddenly rose and said, Gentlemen, please excuse me. I will retire. It is the glory of a man to have clean lips and a clean mind. It is the glory of a woman not to know evil, even in her thoughts. Isaac Newton's most intimate friend in young manhood was a noted foreign chemist. They were constant associates until one day the Italian told an impure story, after which Newton never would associate with him. My extreme youth, when I took command of the army of Italy, said Napoleon, rendered it necessary that I should evince great reserve of manners and the utmost severity of morals. This was indispensable to enable me to sustain authority over men so greatly my superiors in age and experience. I pursued a line of conduct in the highest degree irreproachable and exemplary. In spotless morality I was a Cato, and must have appeared such to all. I was a philosopher and a sage. My supremacy could be retained only by proving myself a better man than any other man in the army. Had I yielded to human weakness, I should have lost my power. The military antagonist and conqueror of Napoleon, the Duke of Wellington, was a man of simple life and austere virtue. When he was laid to rest in the crypt of St. Paul's Cathedral, in streaming London's central roar, the poet who wrote his funeral ode was able to say of him, Whatever record leap to light, he never shall be shamed. 
The peril of impurity lies in the insidiousness of the poison. Just one taint of impurity, one glance at a lewd picture, one hearing of an unclean story may begin the fatal corruption of mind and heart. It is the little rift within the lute that by and by will make the music mute, the little rift within the lover's lute, or little pitted speck in garnered fruit, that rotting inward slowly moulders all. When Bunyan's pilgrim was assailed by temptation, he stopped his ears with his fingers and fled for his life. Let the young man who values himself, who sets store upon health, and has ambition to succeed in his chosen career, be deaf to unclean speech, and flee the companionship of those who think and speak uncleanness. It is the experience of every man who has forsaken vice and turned his feet into the paths of virtue, that evil memories will, in his holiest hours, leap upon him like a lion from ambush. Into the harmony of the hymn he sings memory, will interpolate unbidden the words of some sensual song. Pictures of his debauches, his past licentiousness, will fill his vision, and the unhappy victim can only beat upon his breast and cry, Me miserable! Whither shall I flee? This has been, through all time, the experience of the men that have sought sanctity in seclusion. The saints, the hermits in their caves, the monks in their cells, could never escape the obsessions of memory, which, with horrible realism and scorching vividness, revived past scenes of sin. A boy once showed to another a book of impure words and pictures. He to whom the book was shown had it in his hands only a few minutes. In after life, he held high office in the church, and years and years afterwards told a friend that he would give half he possessed had he never seen it, because its impure images at the most holy times would arise unbidden to his mind. Physicians tell us that every particle of the body changes in a very few years, but no chemistry, human or divine, can entirely expunge from the mind a bad picture. Like the paintings buried for years in Pompeii, without the loss of tint or shade, these pictures are as brilliant in age as in youth. Association begets assimilation. We cannot mix with evil associations without being contaminated, cannot touch pitch without being defiled. Impurity is especially fatal in its grip upon the young, because of the vividness of the youthful imagination, and the facility with which insinuating suggestions enter the youthful thought. Indelible and satanic is the taint of the evil suggestive power which a lewd, questionable picture or story leaves upon the mind. Nothing else more fatally mars the ideals of life and lowers the standard of manhood and womanhood. To read writers whose lines express the utmost possible impurity, so dexterously and cunningly that not a vulgar word is used, but rosy, glowing, suggestive language, authors who soften evil and show deformity with the tints of beauty, what is this but to take the feet out of the straight road into the guiltiest path of seduction? Very few realize the power of a diseased imagination to ruin a precious life. Perhaps the defect began in a little speck of taint. No other faculty has such power to curse or bless mankind, to build up or tear down, to ennoble or debauch, to make happy or miserable, or has such power upon our destiny as the imagination. Many a ruined life began its downfall in the dry rot of a perverted imagination. How little we realize that by subtle, 
moral manufacture. Repeated acts of the imagination weave themselves into a mighty tapestry, every figure and fancy of which will stand out in living colors in the character web of our lives to approve or condemn us. In many cases where, for no apparent reason, one is making failure after failure, never reaching, even approximately, the position which was anticipated for him. If he would look frankly into his own heart, and searchingly at his own secret habits, he would find that which, hidden like the worm at the heart of the rose, is destroying and making impossible all that ennobles, beautifies, and enriches life. I solemnly warn you, says Beecher, against indulging a morbid imagination. In that busy and mischievous faculty begins the evil. Were it not for his airy imagination, man might stand his own master, not overmatched by the worst part of himself. But, ah, these summer reveries, these venturesome dreams, these fairy castles, builded for no good purposes, they are haunted by impure spirits who will fascinate, bewitch, and corrupt you. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed art thou, most favoured of God, whose thoughts are chastened, whose imagination will not breathe or fly in tainted air, and whose path hath been measured by the golden reed of purity. To be pure in heart is the youth's first great commandment. Do not listen to men who tell you that vice is a necessity. Nothing is a necessity that is wrong, that debauches self-respect. All wickedness is weakness. Vice and vigor have nothing in common. Purity is strength, health, power. Do not imagine that impurity can be hidden. One may as well expect to have consumption or any other deadly disease and to look and appear healthy as to be impure in thought and mind and to look and appear manly and noble-souled. Character writes its record in the flesh. No, no, these are not trifles, said George Whitefield, when a friend asked why he was so particular to bathe frequently and always have his linen scrupulously clean. A minister must be without spot, even in his garments. Purity in a good man cannot be carried too far. There is a permanency in the stamp left by the sins resulting from impure thought that follows even to the grave. Diseases unnameable, the consequences of the scarlet sin, the following after the strange woman, write their record in the very bones, literally fulfilling the scripture statement. Their sins shall lie down with their bones in the dust. We often detect in the eye and in the manner the black leper spots of impurity, long before the youth suspects they have ever been noticed. When there is a scar or a stain upon one's self-respect, it is bound to appear on the surface sooner or later. What fearful blots and stains are left on the characters of those who have to fight for a lifetime to rid themselves of a blighting and contaminating influence, moral or physical. Chemists tell us that scarlet is the only color which cannot be bleached. There is no known chemical which can remove it. So, formerly, scarlet rags were made into blotting paper. When the sacred writer wished to emphasize the power of divine forgiveness, of divine love, he said, Even though thy sins be as scarlet, they shall be made white as wool. It certainly takes omnipotent power to expunge impurity from the mind. There is certainly one sin which only divine power can bleach out of the character, the sin of impurity. No man can think much of himself when he is conscious of impurity anywhere in his life. 
and the very knowledge that one is absolutely pure in his thought and clean in his life increases his self-respect and his self-faith wonderfully. It is a terrible handicap to be conscious that, however much others may think of us, we are foul inside, that our thoughts are vile. It does not matter that our vicious acts are secret. We cannot cover them. Whatever we have thought or done will outpicture itself in the expression, in the bearing. It will be hung out upon the bulletin board of the face and manner for the world to read. We instinctively feel a person's reality, not what he pretends, but what he is, for we radiate our reality, which often contradicts our words. There is only one panacea for impurity. Constant occupation and pure, high thinking are absolutely necessary to a clean life. I should be a poor counsellor of young men, wrote a true friend of youth, if I taught you that purity is possible only by isolation from the world. We do not want that sort of holiness, which can thrive only in seclusion. We want that virile, manly purity, which keeps itself unspotted from the world, even amid its worst debasements. Just as the lily lifts its slender chalice of white and gold to heaven, untainted by the soil in which it grows, though that soil be the reservoir of death and putrefaction. Impurity is the forfeiture of manliness. The true man must be untarnished. James went so far as to declare that this is just what religion is. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this to keep himself unspotted from the world. Every true man shrinks from uncleanness. He knows what it means. Impurity makes lofty friendships impossible. It robs all of life's intercourse of its freshness and its joyous innocence. It sullies all beauty. It does these things chiefly because it separates men from God and His vision. The best and holiest is barred to the stained man. Impurity makes it impossible for him to appreciate what is pure and fine, dulls his finer perceptions, and he is not given the place where only pure and fine things are. There can be no such thing as an impure gentleman. The two words contradict each other. The gentleman must be pure. He does not have fine clothes. He may have had few advantages, but he must be pure and clean. And, if he have all outward grace and gift, and be inwardly unclean, though he may call himself a gentleman, he is a liar and a lie. O oh, young man, guard your heart purity, keep your innocency, never lose it. If it be gone, you have lost from the casket the most precious gift of God, the first purity of imagination, of thought, and of feeling, if soiled, can be cleansed by no fuller's soap. If a heart be broken, art may repair it. If a light be quenched, the flame may kindle it. But if a flower be crushed, what art can repair it? If an odour be wafted away, who can collect or bring it back? Parents are, in many cases, responsible for the impurity of their children. Through a mistaken sense of delicacy, they allow the awakened, searching mind of the child to get information concerning its physical nature from the mind of some boy or girl no better taught than itself, and so conceive wholly wrong and harmful ideas concerning things of which it is vitally important that every human being should at the onset of life have clear and adequate ideas. Such silence, many times, 
is fatal, and always foolish, if not criminal. I have noticed, said William Acton, that all patients who have confessed to me that they have practiced vice, lamented that they were not, when children, made aware of its consequences. And I have been pressed over and over again to urge on parents, guardians, schoolmasters, and others interested in the education of youth, the necessity of giving to their charges some warning, some intimation of their danger. To parents and guardians, I offer my earnest advice that they should, by hearty sympathy and frank explanation, aid their charges in maintaining pure lives. What stronger breastplate than a heart untainted? A prominent writer says, If young persons poison their bodies and corrupt their minds with vicious courses, no lapse of time, after a reform, is likely to restore them to physical soundness and the sole purity of their earlier days. There is one idea concerning purity which should never have been conceived, and, having been conceived, should be once and forever eternally exploded. It is that purity is different in the different sexes. It would be loosening the foundations of virtue to countenance the notion that, because of a difference in sex, men are at liberty to set morality at defiance, and to do with impunity that which, if done by a woman, would stain her character for life. To maintain a pure and virtuous condition of society, therefore, man, as well as woman, must be virtuous and pure, both alike shunning all acts infringing on the heart, character, and conscience, shunning them as poison, which, once imbibed, can never be entirely thrown out again. Is there any reason why a man should have any license to drag his thoughts through the mud and filth any more than a woman? Is there any sex in principle? Isn't a stain a blot upon a boy's character just as bad as upon a girl's? If purity is so refining and elevating for one sex, why should it not be for the other? It is incredible that a man should be socially ostracized for comparatively minor offences, yet be rotten with immorality, and be received into the best homes. But if a woman makes the least false step in this direction, she is not only ostracized, but treated with the utmost contempt, while the man who is the chief sinner in causing a woman's downfall, society will pardon. To put it on the very lowest ground, I am certain that if young men knew and realized the fearful risks to health that they take by indulging in gross impurities, they would put them by with a shudder of disgust and aversion. It may very easily happen, it very often actually does happen, that one single step from the path of purity clouds a man's whole life with misery and unspeakable suffering. And not only that, but even entails lifelong disease on children yet unborn. To return to its maker at the close of life, the marvellous body which he gave us, scarred by a heedless life, with the heart rotten with impurity, the imagination filled with vicious images, the character honeycombed with vice, is the most ungrateful return for the priceless life of opportunity. A mind retaining all the dew and freshness of innocence shrinks from the very idea of impurity, the very suggestion of it, as if it were sin to have even thought or heard of it, as if even the shadow of the evil would leave some soil on the unsullied whiteness of the virgin mind. When modesty is once extinguished, it knows not a return. End of chapter 49
The Power of Purity. Chapter 50 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Martin. Chapter 50 The Habit of Happiness. The highest happiness must always come from the exercise of the best thing in us. When you find happiness in anything but useful work, you will be the first man or woman to make the discovery. If you take an inventory of yourself at the very outset of your career, you will find that you think you are going to find happiness in things or in conditions. Most people think they are going to find the largest part of their happiness in money. What money will buy or what it will give them in the way of power, influence, comforts, luxuries. They think they are going to find a great deal of their happiness in marriage. How quickly they find that the best happiness they will ever know is that which must be limited to their own capacity for enjoyment, that their happiness cannot come from anything outside of them, but must be developed from within. Many people believe they are going to find much of their happiness in books, in travel, in leisure, in freedom from the thousand and one anxieties and cares and worries of business. But the moment they get in the position where they thought they would have freedom, many other things come up in their minds and cut off much of the expected joy. When they get money and leisure, they often find that they are growing selfish, which cuts off a lot of their happiness. No man able to work can be idle without feeling a sense of guilt at not doing his part in the world. For every time he sees the poor, laboring people who are working for him, who are working everywhere, he is constantly reminded of his meanness in shifting upon others what he is able to do and ought to do himself. Idleness is the last place to look for happiness. Idleness is like a stagnant pool. The moment the water ceases to flow, to work, to do something, all sorts of vermin and hideous creatures develop in it. It becomes torpid and unhealthy, giving out miasma and repulsive odors. In the same way, work is the only thing that will keep the individual healthy and wholesome and clean. An idle brain very quickly breeds impurities. The married man quickly learns that his domestic happiness depends upon what he himself contributes to the partnership, that he cannot take out a great deal without putting a great deal in, for selfishness always reaps a mean, despicable harvest. It is only the generous giver who gets much. There is nothing which will so shrivel up a man and contract his capacity for happiness as selfishness. It is always a fatal blighter, blaster, disappointer. We must give to get. We must be great before we can get great enjoyment. Great in our motive, grand in our endeavor, sublime in our ideas. It is impossible, absolutely unscientific, for a bad person to be truly happy. Just as impossible as it would be for one to be comfortable while lying on a bed of nettles which are constantly pricking him. There is no way under heaven by which a person can be really happy without being good, clean, square, and true. This does not mean that a person is happy because he does not use tobacco, drink, gamble, use profane language, or does not do other vicious things. Some of the meanest, narrowest, most contemptible people in the world do none of these things, but they are uncharitable, jealous, envious, revengeful. They stab you in the back, slander you, cheat you. They may be cunning, underhanded, and yet have a fairly good standing in the church. No person can be really happy who has a small, narrow, bigoted, uncharitable mind or disposition. Generosity, charity, kindness are absolutely essential to real happiness. Deceitful people cannot be happy. 
they cannot respect themselves, because they inwardly despise themselves for deceiving you. A person must be open-minded, transparent, simple, in order to be really happy. A person who is always covering up something, trying to keep things from you, misleading you, deceiving you, cannot get away from self-reproach, and hence cannot be really happy. Selfishness is a fatal enemy of happiness, because no one ever does a really selfish thing without feeling really mean, without despising himself for it. I have never seen a strong young man sneak into a vacant seat in a car and allow an old man or woman with a package or a baby in her arms to stand, without looking as though he knew he had done a mean, selfish thing. There is a look of humiliation in his face. We are so constituted that we cannot help condemning ourselves for our mean or selfish acts. The liar is never really happy. He is always on nettles, lest his deceit betray him. He never feels safe. Dishonesty in all its phases is fatal to happiness, for no dishonest person can get his self-approval. Without this, no happiness is possible. Before you can be really happy, my friend, you must be able to look back upon a well-spent past, a conscientious, unselfish past. If not, you will be haunted by demons which will destroy your happiness. If you have been mean and selfish, greedy and dishonest with your fellow men, all sorts of horrible things will rise out of your money pile to terrify and to make your happiness impossible. In other words, happiness is merely a result of the life work. It will partake of the exact quality of the motive which you have put into your life work. If these motives have been selfish, greedy, grasping, if cunning and dishonesty, have dominated in your career, your happiness will be marred accordingly. You cannot complain of your happiness, because it is your own child, the product of your own brain, your own effort. It has been made up of your motives, colored by your life aim. It exactly corresponds to the cause which produced it. There is the greatest difference in the world between the happiness which comes from a sweet, beautiful, unselfish, helpful, sympathetic, industrious, honorable career, and the mean satisfaction which may grow to be a part of your marked self if you have lived a selfish, grasping life. What we call happiness is the harvest from our life sowing, our habitual thought sowing, deed doing. If we have sown selfish, envious, jealous, revengeful, hateful seeds, greedy, grasping seeds, we cannot expect a golden happiness harvest like that which comes from a clean and unselfish, helpful sowing. If our harvest is full of the rank, poisonous weeds of jealousy, envy, dishonesty, cunning, and cruelty, we have no one to blame but ourselves, for we sowed the seed which produced that sort of a harvest. Somehow some people have an entirely wrong idea of what real happiness is. They seem to think it can be bought, can be had by influence, that it can be purchased by money, that if they have money they can get that wonderful, mysterious thing which they call happiness. But happiness is its natural, faithful harvest from our sowing. It would be as impossible for selfish seed, greed seed, to produce a harvest of contentment, of genuine satisfaction, of real joy, as for thistle seeds to produce a harvest of wheat or corn. Whatever the quality of your enjoyment or happiness may be, you have patterned it by your life motive, by the spirit in which you have worked, by the principles which have actuated you. A pretty different harvest, I grant, many of us must face, marred with all sorts of hideous, poisonous weeds. But they are all the legitimate product of our sowing. 
No one can rob us of our harvest or change it very much. Every thought, every act, every motive, whether secret or public, is a seed which no power on earth can prevent going to its harvest of beauty or ugliness, honor or shame. Most people have an idea that happiness is something that can be manufactured. They do not realize that it can be no more manufactured than wheat or corn can be manufactured. It must be grown, and the harvest will be like the seed. You, young man, make up your mind at the very outset of your career, that whatever comes to you in life, that whether you succeed or fail, whether you have this or that, there is one thing you will have, and that is a happy, contented mind, that you will extract your happiness as you go along. You will not take the chances of picking up or developing the happy habit after you get rich, for then you may be too old. Most people postpone their enjoyment until they are disappointed to find the power of enjoyment has largely gone by, and that even if they had the means they could not get anything like as much real happiness out of it as they could have gotten as they went along when they were younger. Take no chances with your happiness, or the sort of a life that can produce it. Whatever else you risk, do not risk this. Early form the happy habit, the habit of enjoyment every day, no matter what comes or does not come to you during the day. Pick crumbs of comfort out of your situation, no matter how unpleasant or disagreeable. I know a man who, although poor, can manage to get more comfort out of a real, tough, discouraging situation than anyone else I have ever seen. I have often seen him when he did not have a dollar to his name, with a wife to support, yet he was always buoyant, happy, cheerful consented. He would even make fun out of an embarrassing situation, see something ludicrous in his extreme poverty. There have never been such conflicting estimates, such varying ideas regarding any state of human condition as to what constitutes happiness. Many people think that it is purchasable with money, but many of the most restless, discontented, unhappy people in the world are rich. They have the means of purchasing what they thought would produce happiness, but the real thing eludes them. On the other hand, some of the poorest people in the world are happy. The fact is that there is no possible way of cornering or purchasing happiness, for it is absolutely beyond the reach of money. It is true we can purchase a few comforts and immunities from some annoyances and worries with money which we cannot get without it. On the other hand, the great majority of people who have inherited money are positively injured by it, because it often stops their own development by taking away the motive for self-effort and self-reliance. When people get money they often stop growing, because they depend upon the money, instead of relying upon their own inherent resources. Rich people suffer from their indulgences more than poor ones suffer from their hardships. A great many rich people die with liver and kidney troubles which are affected both by eating and drinking. The kidneys are very susceptible to the presence of alcohol. If rich people try to get greater enjoyment out of life than poor people by eating and drinking, they are likely very quickly to come to grief. If they try to seek it through the avenue of leisure, they soon find that an idle brain is one of the most dangerous things in the world. Nothing deteriorates faster. The mind was made for continual, strong action, systematic, vigorous exercise, and this is possible only when some dominating aim and a great life purpose leads the way. No person can be really healthful whose mind is not usefully and continually employed. So there is no possibility of finding real happiness in idleness, if we are able to work. 
Nature brings a wonderful compensatory power to those who are crippled or sick, or otherwise disabled from working. But there is no compensation for idleness in those who are able to work. Nature only gives us the use of faculties we employ. Use or lose is her motto. And when we cease to use a faculty or function, it is gradually taken away from us, gradually shrills and atrophies. There is no satisfaction like that which comes from the steady, persistent, honest, conscientious pursuit of a noble aim. There are a multitude of evidences in man's very structure that his marvellous mechanism was intended for action, for constant exercise, and that idleness and stagnation always mean deterioration and death of power. No man can remain idle without shrinking, shriveling, constantly becoming a less efficient man, for he can keep up only those faculties and powers which he constantly employs, and there is no other possible way. Nature puts her ban of deterioration and loss of power upon idleness. We see these victims everywhere, shorn of power, weak, nerveless, backboneless, staminaless, gritless people, without forcefulness, mere non-entities because they have ceased working. Without work, mental health is impossible, and without health, the fullest happiness is impossible. It has been said that happiness is the most delusive thing that man pursues. Yet, why need it be a blind search? If we were to stop the first hundred people we meet on the street and ask them what in their experience has given them the most happiness, probably the answer of no two would be alike. How interesting and constructive it would be to give a thousand dollars to each of these hundred people, and without their knowing it, Follow them and see what they would do with the money, what it would mean to them. To some poor youth, hungry for an education, with no opportunity to gain it, this money would mean a college education. Another would see in his money a more comfortable home for his aged parents. To another, this money would suggest all sorts of dissipation. Some would see books and leisure for self-improvement, a trip abroad, we all wear different colored glasses, and no two see life with the same tint. Some find their present happiness in coarse dissipation, others in a quiet nook with a book. Some find their greatest happiness in friends, in social intercourse. Others seek happiness in roving over the earth, always thinking that the greatest enjoyment is in another day, in another place, a little further on in the next room, or tomorrow, or in another country. To many people, happiness is never where they are, but almost anywhere else. Most people lose sight of the simplicity of happiness. They look for it in big, complicated things. Real happiness is perfectly simple. In fact, it is incompatible with complexity. Simplicity is its very essence. I was dining recently with a particularly successful young man who is trying very hard to be happy. But he takes such a complicated, strenuous view of everything that his happiness is always flying from him. He drives everything so fiercely. His life is so vigorous, so complicated that happiness cannot find a home with him very long. Nor does he understand why. He has money, health, but he always has that restless, far away, absent-minded gaze into something beyond, and I do not think he is ever really very happy. His whole manner of living is extremely complex. He does not seem to know where to find happiness. He has evidently mistaken the very nature of happiness. He thinks it consists in making a great show, in having great possessions, in doing things which attract a great deal of attention. But happiness would be strangled 
suffocated in such an environment. The essentials of real happiness are few, simple, and close at hand. Happiness is made up of very simple ingredients. It flees from the complex life. It evades pomp and show. The heart would starve amid the greatest luxuries. Simple joys and the treasures of the heart and mind make happiness. Happiness has very little to do with material things. It is a mental state of mind. Real permanent happiness cannot be found in mere temporary things, because its roots reach away down into eternal principles. One of the most pathetic pictures in civilization is the great army of men and women searching the world over for happiness, as though it existed in things rather than in a state of mind. The people who have spent years and a fortune trying to find it look as hungry and as lean of contentment and all that makes life desirable as when they started out. Chasing happiness all over the world is about as silly a business as any human being ever engaged in, for it was never yet found by any pursuer. Yet happiness is the simplest thing in the world. It is found in many a home with carpetless floors and pictureless walls. It knows neither rank, station, nor color, nor does it recognize wealth. It only demands that it live with a contented mind and pure heart. It will not live with ostentation. It flees from pretense. It loves the simple life. It insists upon a sweet, healthful, natural environment. It hates the forced and complicated and formal. Real happiness flees from the things that pass away. It abides only in principle, permanency. I have never seen a person who has lived a grasping, greedy, money-chasing life who was not disappointed at what money has given him for his trouble. It is only in giving, in helping, that we find our quest. Everywhere we go, we see people who are disappointed, chagrined, shocked, to find that what they thought would be the angel of happiness turned out to be only a ghost. All the misery and the crime of the world rest upon the failure of human beings to understand the principle that no man can really be happy until he harmonizes with the best thing in him, with the divine, and not with the brute. No one can be happy who tries to harmonize his life with his animal instincts. The God, the good, in him, is the only possible thing that can make him happy. Real happiness cannot be bribed by anything sordid or low. Nothing mean or unworthy appeals to it. There is no affinity between them. Founded upon principle, it is as scientific as the laws of mathematics, and he who works his problem correctly will get the happiness answer. There is only one way to secure the correct answer to a mathematical problem, and that is to work in harmony with mathematical laws. It would not matter if half the world believed there was some other way to get the answer. It would never come until the law was followed with the utmost exactitude. It does not matter that the great majority of the human race believe there is some other way of reaching the happiness goal. The fact that they are discontented, restless, and unhappy shows that they are not working their problem scientifically. We are all conscious that there is another man inside of us, that there accompanies us through life, a divine, silent messenger, that other, higher, better self, which speaks from the depth of our nature and which gives its consent, its Amen, to every right action, and condemns every wrong one. Man is built upon the plan of honesty, of rectitude, the divine plan. When he perverts his nature by trying to express dishonesty, chicanery, and cunning, of course he cannot be happy. The very essence of happiness is honesty, sincerity, truthfulness. 
He who will have a real happiness for his companion must be clean, straightforward, and sincere. The moment he departs from the right, she will take wings and fly away. It is just as impossible for a person to reach the normal state of harmony while he is practicing selfish, grasping methods as it is to produce harmony in an orchestra with instruments that are all jangled and out of tune. To be happy, we must be in tune with the infinite within us, in harmony with our better selves. There is no way to get around it. There is no tonic like that which comes from doing things worth while. There is no happiness like that which comes from doing our level best every day, everywhere. No satisfaction like that which comes from stamping superiority, putting our royal trademark upon everything which goes through our hands. Recently a rich young man was asked why he did not work. I do not have to, he said. Do not have to has ruined more young men than almost anything else. The fact is, nature never made any provision for the idle man. Vigorous activity is the law of life. It is the saving grace, the only thing that can keep a human being from retrograding. Activity along the line of one's highest ambition is the normal state of man, and he who tries to evade it pays the penalty in deterioration of faculty, in paralysis of efficiency. Do not flatter yourself that you can be really happy unless you are useful. Happiness and usefulness were born twins. To separate them is fatal. It is as impossible for a human being to be happy who is habitually idle as it is for a fine chronometer to be normal when not running. The highest happiness is the feeling of well-being which comes to one who is actively employed, doing what he was made to do carrying out the great life purpose patterned in his individual bent. The practical fulfilling of the life purpose is to man what the actual running and keeping time are to the watch. Without action, both are meaningless. Man was made to do things. Nothing else can take the place of achievement in his life. Real happiness without achievement of some worthy aim is unthinkable. One of the greatest satisfactions in this world is the feeling of enlargement, of growth, of stretching upward and onward. No pleasure can surpass that which comes from the consciousness of feeling one's horizon of ignorance being pushed farther and farther away, of making headway in the world, of not only getting on, but also of getting up. Happiness is incompatible with stagnation. A man must feel his expanding power lifting, tugging away at a lofty purpose, or he will miss the joy of living. The discords, the bickerings, the divorces, the breaking up of rich homes, and the resorting to all sorts of silly devices by many rich people in their pursuit of happiness prove that it does not dwell with them, that happiness does not abide with low ideals, with selfishness, idleness, and discord. It is a friend of harmony, of truth, of beauty, of affection, of simplicity. Multitudes of men have made fortunes, but have murdered their capacity for enjoyment in the process. How often we hear the remark, he has the money, but cannot enjoy it. A man can have no greater delusion than that he can spend the best years of his life coining all of his energies into dollars, neglecting his home, sacrificing friendships, self-improvement, and everything else that is really worth while for money, and yet find happiness at the end. The happiness habit is just as necessary to our best welfare as the work habit, or the honesty or square dealing habit. No one can do his best, his highest thing, who is not perfectly normal, and happiness is a fundamental necessity of our being. 
It is an indication of health, of sanity, of harmony. The opposite is a symptom of disease, of abnormality. There are plenty of evidences in the human economy that we were intended for happiness, that it is our normal condition, that suffering, unhappiness, discontent are absolutely foreign and abnormal to our natures. There is no doubt that our life was intended to be one grand, sweet song. We are built upon the plan of harmony, and every form of discord is abnormal. There is something wrong when any human being in this world, tuned to infinite harmonies and beauties that are unspeakable, is unhappy and discontented. End of chapter 50 The Habit of Happiness